Hello again and welcome back to Garage Science. This time I'll be printing, assembling, wiring, and testing the smallest pulse motor on YouTube, or at the very least the smallest one I could find. I've compressed this as much as possible to keep the video length reasonable, so if you have questions leave them in the comments. Let's get started. The motor was designed in Autodesk Fusion 360. I designed it to have an overall diameter of 30mm and a height of 16mm. It uses a hand wrapped coil, a reed relay, and four neodymium magnets that are 6mm in diameter and 3mm thick. A simple motor controller using a transistor and a potentiometer allows the motor to be throttled. I had originally designed this motor to use a second coil that would function as the sensing coil, but because there wasn't enough induction in the sensing coil to turn on the motoring coil, I had to resort to using a reed relay instead. More on why this didn't work later. The principle of a pulse motor is that a sensor energizes a coil which then repels magnets which are attached to a rotor. When the rotor turns, the coil de-energizes, allowing the next magnet to spin into position. Once the sensor is tripped again, the second magnet is repelled and the cycle repeats itself hundreds of times a second. Because my sensing coil didn't work, I had to replace it with a mount for the reed relay, which can be seen here. Once my motor was modeled, it was printed on a Draken DLP 3D printer by 3D Facture. I used Autodesk Magenta Resin and got very nice looking parts. As usual, support material needed to be removed and the resulting bumpy surface was sanded with 400 grit sandpaper. The supports were generated with Autodesk Print Studio, which was developed for the Ember 3D printer, and even though it isn't undergoing further development, it is still very good at generating supports, better than Mesh Mixer in my opinion. Each coil was wrapped with 32 gauge magnet wire very carefully to avoid breaking the small shaft that they were wrapped around. If you attempt this, patience is definitely key. I wrapped the coils until more wraps would unlikely remain on the coil. I didn't count the turns, but by my estimates, each coil is about 2 to 3 microhenries. The motor already had most of its shape once all the parts were printed. A finishing nail was used as an axle for the motor. This motor works without a bearing because the nail will spin within a recess in the motor base and the top of the nail would be held in position by a rotor stabilizer that covers the rotor. The top of the nail was cut off and the top was sanded and rounded to reduce sharp edges. The magnets and axle were installed in the rotor using a two-part epoxy. I used a small coil of solder to provide a 2mm spacing between the base and the bottom of the rotor. Looking back, this probably should have been closer to 3-4mm to just to ensure there is enough clearance. In order to create a bigger clearance, I filed the bottom of the rotor a little, but not much since there was only 1mm separating the bottom of the rotor from the magnets inside. Once the epoxy was cured, the rotor could spin very well as a top, which showed that it was balanced. However, after spinning the rotor on the base several times, it became apparent that the nail was digging into the surface of the base. I expected this would happen a little bit, but didn't think it would be very substantial. To remedy this, I coated the surface of the base with the same two-part epoxy to give a hard surface for the rotor to spin on. Now by using a magnet, the rotor can actually be spun somewhat. Time to start gluing parts together. I used superglue to attach the rotor stabilizer to the base with the rotor between the two. The rotor is now permanently installed and I used a can of dust off to ensure the rotor spun balanced and free. Next, I superglued the motoring coil in place. It is important that the motoring coil is installed before the sensor because the exact placement of the sensor will affect the timing of the motoring coil. With the motoring coil installed, the ends of the coil were sanded to remove the insulation and 20 gauge wire was soldered to the end to make it easier to plug into a breadboard. The assembly is most of the way done, so now it's time to go over the motor controller circuit. The original circuit used a sensing coil to induce a current in the base of a transistor that was throttled with a potentiometer. The transistor controlled the amount of current through the motoring coil at the top of the diagram. A kickback diode on each coil prevented high voltages from occurring that may damage the transistor or my power supply. The principle of operation is that when the magnet passes the sensing coil, it induces a current which then causes some level of saturation in the transistor that allows current to flow through the motoring coil. The motoring coil then repels the magnet in the rotor, causing it to spin and re-energize the sensing coil again. 
Unfortunately, in practice, I was not able to get any kind of measurable current through the sensing coil. This is likely due to the relatively small size of the coil and the lack of a ferrous core. The lack of voltage seen here was a sensing coil connected in series with just one 1000 ohm resistor with the voltmeter measuring across the resistor. To get the motor controller working, I used a reed relay in series with a potentiometer to throttle current to the base of the transistor. The magnets would cause the reed relay to shut and energize the motor and coil. The throttling works because the current through the collector of the transistor is equal to the current gain, or beta, times the current through the base. It's important that if you forego the throttling feature and connect the reed relay in series with the motor and coil, that you use a kickback diode. If you don't, you will have a substantial arcing across the relay that will degrade the contacts, eventually causing them not to work. Most reed relays will come packaged in a housing with a built-in coil. I am only interested in the glass tube with the actual contacts, and so I disassembled the relay and pulled the contacts out of the housing. A reed relay consists of two small pieces of metal in a vacuum sealed tube with a very small gap between them. When the metal strips are in a magnetic field, they align completely and touch each other. This type of relay opens and shuts very quickly, which is why it's ideal for a pulse motor. The reed relay is essentially providing the commutation for the pulse motor. Now with the reed relay installed in the motor controller circuit, a quick flick of the rotor brings the pulse motor to life for the first time. To mount the reed relay, I originally intended to mount it right next to the rotor as I had modeled it in Fusion 360. Unfortunately, this caused the reed relay to not shut at the right time. In order to get the motor working, I had to mount the relay at an angle to the rotor to get it to shut properly. I will describe why that is later. I used a small amount of WD-40 to lubricate the motor. I was also able to successfully throttle the motor with the potentiometer as designed. The frame rate of the camera makes it difficult to see the motor changing speed, but the current to the motor and coil was throttled between 300 and 500 milliamps with a steady 5 volt input voltage. The mini pulse motor is now complete. It spins well and should last a long time. It has a soft rumble and a rapid ticking sound from the relay shutting and opening. Now the reason why the relay had to be angled is related to the direction of the magnetic field. The internal coil in the reed relay housing produces a magnetic field in which the contacts run parallel to the field lines. This causes the contacts to align with the field and touch. Having the reed relay perpendicular to the magnet causes the contacts to be more or less perpendicular to the magnetic field. The result is that for each pass of the magnet the relay switches on and off twice, once as the magnet approaches and once as it moves away. The time the magnet spends directly in front of the relay does not shut the relay and the relay remains open. This double switching action keeps the motor and coil from repelling the magnets properly and the motor never spins on its own. However, if you place the relay at an angle, the magnetic field will be at an angle as the magnet passes it, causing only one on-off switch of the relay. This is ultimately the reason for placing the relay at an angle on the side of the motor base. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching. If you did, be sure to like the video. If you have any questions or critiques, leave it in the comments, and be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.